Daily news and analysis. We keep you informed and inspired. This is World Today. Hello and welcome to World Today. I'm Zhao Ying. Coming up, President Xi Jinping has urged Fujian province to play a pioneering role in China's modernization drive. A two-day meeting of SCO heads of governments has concluded in Islamabad. What has been achieved? China will introduce a slew of incremental measures to stabilize the property sector. What do they mean to property developers and home buyers? Chinese President Xi Jinping has visited the eastern province of Fujian to inspect efforts in rural revitalization, cultural heritage protection, and free trade development. The president has urged the region to play a pioneering role in the country's modernization drive by staying committed to its development goals. He said there will be a brighter and more prosperous future in country life as he toured a village in Zhangzhou. President Xi also visited a memorial hall of Gu Wenchang, a local official who is famous for fighting desertification. He also stopped at a cultural industrial park. On Wednesday, the leader inspected the free trade zone in Xiamen, where he urged more efforts to expand the country's high-level opening up. The president also called on Fujian to set an example in coordinated regional development and integrated urban-rural development. For more, we are joined by Chu Qian, fellow of the Belt and Road Research Center at Minzu University of China. President Xi urged Fujian Province to accelerate the development of a modern economic system. How do you see Fujian contributing to China's overall modernization goals? And are there specific industries in Fujian that are expected to lead this effort? Well, yes, I think Fujian is a very important and also iconic,、um, you know, regional economy in China.、Um, Fujian is actually、uh, where the Chinese reform and opening up policy begins. And the whole story of Fujian actually can represent its nepotization of China. Fujian used to be a very, very poor provinces. Only you know the refugees and you know flee away、uh, immigrants will go to Fujian because in there you basically cannot you know plan enough farming you know、uh, industries in there, and、uh, they're all mountainous areas. So a lot of people need to you know survive with very barren land, land and also very bad natural conditions. But now, if you go to Fujian, you find that basically a total different story and total different world. And that is probably the most marketized economy, mo- with most advanced technology, with the most n- one of the most n- numbers of the listed company in China, as well as the Fujian people and their enterprises influences are spill over and influencing the whole world. And their GDP ranking top in among Chinese. The 34 provincial units, and their private sectors actually have been mounting the top three provinces in China. But meanwhile, when Fujian is doing very well in their economy, they've also been providing a very good example for environmental protections. So, which means they're doing it in a very smart way and also doing it in a green way while making profit and influencing the whole world. So, I think the way of Fujian is actually showing the way of China now and in the future. Well, President Xi called for deeper integration between scientific and technological innovation and industrial innovation. What practical steps can be taken to foster this integration? Well, I think number one, Fujian has showed a very example of this integration. How we can make sure that scientific research result can be actually being used in industry, in manufacturing, and generate concrete result of profit, and also nurture industries and you know help with the local society. I think、uh, in Fujian, number one, they paid great attention to the enterprises. The role of enterprises as practitioners in industry is very important. We know、uh, many people are counting on the universities, the research institute, to take the leading role in this regard. But we understand you can only achieve this kind of integration, and you can er- only achieve the real achievement by doing it. Not only by doing it in the lab, but also doing it in the market, and also doing it in the workshop. And I think Fujian has just doing the right thing. In Fujian, they have many listed companies, probably representing the highest technology, not only in their own industry in China, but also in the whole world. For example, the CATL is the leading battery factory, leading battery makers. And all over the world, and also Fuyao Glass, 
90% of the world vehicles are using their glasses. It's very tough, it's very resilient, and also very affordable. And also they have Pian Zai Huang, the secret recipe of the traditional Chinese medicine, as well as uh, the uh, Racing Way, the cheap makers, and also Kun Tai Kuzi. And all those are basically the vivid example of how they combined the research together with the practitioners and applications. And meanwhile, they try to bring in lots of the talents to give them the tax you know, favorable conditions to give them, you know, the housing conditions to give them the favorable loan conditions. So many of them just to come to this place to start the company. That's the reason why I think in Fujian, especially in Xiamen, Grand Xiamen region, they have most of the private sectors and most of the high tech companies around China, just next to the Bay areas in Guangdong. And meanwhile, internationalization and international cooperation, I think is another important recipe in Fujian. Fujian is thousands of years of linking to the overseas China. They have many, uh, you know, migrant uh, Fujian people overseas, and also they've been linking very conveniently to uh, Japan, to ASEAN nations, to South Korea, and, and etc. So they actually know how to take advantage of this role geopolitically, and also bring in lots of international cooperation and a joint venture. So these international reach, which empowered Fujian to become a new height in the international uh, technology development and also marketization and commercialization and nurtured Fujian industry. Yes, and uh, actually the free trade zone in Xiamen was also highlighted as a key area for institutional opening up. Can you elaborate on what institutional opening up entails? Well, I think Xiamen, especially, uh, you know, on the frontier of the Chinese opening up, they've been witnessing, you know, uh, all the other comp- counterparts, how they're doing it, how Taiwan province are doing it, how Hong Kong city are doing it, and uh, you know all the other uh, competitors like South Korea and Japan, how they're doing it. And they try to learn the uh, strong suit. For example, they started more than 6,000 of all kinds of policy combos uh, leading the whole nations. And they try to build you know, the platform, use platform as a strategy. For example, they now have uh, the aircraft and aviation industry platform. They have the financial leasing platform. They have the uh, uh, integrated circuits platform Within probably 10 kilometers radius, you can find all the OEM you know, supply chains. And all these integration platform enabled Fujian, especially Shaman Auto uh, Trade Zone, uh, a free trade zone, to nurture the strong suit. And also they combined uh, the strong suit by hand in hand with Taiwan in this uh, free trade zone. They nurtured more than 10,000 Taiwan-founded under uh, the uh, enterprises. Some are uh, solely owned, some are joint venture, and they use financial innovation to nurture and make it bigger of this platform through the international trade and international corporations. And besides the manufacturing and the smart uh, industry. They also try to bring in the culture and the services and to make the culture the new growth point and the uh, tourism and environmental protection industry a new growth point. So they always try to nurture the new things, try to seek the profit and the growth in the new incremental point. I think this is the key, you know, how to free up your mind and how to free up your practice. This is the key of the Shaman uh, free trade zone. Yes, and she mentioned plans to boost the marine economy in studies like Xiamen and Fuzhou. So what industries or projects are involved in this effort? And what does this marine economy mean to Fujian's um, overall economic growth? Well, marine economy is basically another uh, hallmark of Fujian's economy. Actually, from thousands of years ago, uh, the Chinese uh, you know, uh, sales has already been you know, starting from the Chuanzhou port, uh, go through all the uh, marina silk road, uh, transporting and uh, shipping all the Chinese uh, ceramic products, textiles and uh, agriculture products uh, to ASEAN nations, to Indian Ocean, and to Mediterranean, and then to Europe. And all these started just from thousands of years ago. And now if you go to Germany and the Netherlands, you find uh, 
the uh, white uh, the white ceramic and white china products and technology actually nurtured uh, in Germany are being originated from China from the Quanzhou and the Zhangzhou starting from thousands of years ago by those sale trade and now this tradition just continued uh, international trade is no doubt to their uh, you know hallmark and uh, in their brand and also they've been partnered with Taiwan which I mentioned so many times these two provinces the two brotherhood forged together and forged a very unique strong suit to, to have a spill over impact over not only uh, ASEAN nations because they have many supply chains right now covering Thailand Malaysia uh, Vietnam and uh, Indonesia and etc but also uh, their supply chain has been now been covering Japan and the South Korea so this has become a center uh, of the manufacturing uh, covering the whole ASEAN and also the Eastern Asian regions and also with technologies and also environmental protection. It's not, I think food Jenner, they actually understand if you continue with the traditional way of the marine economy, which is fishing and fishing, this is going to be a dead end. After exhausted all the resources and all the fishes and the seafood, you're probably going to suffer from it. But they understand uh, by selling and eating up more of the fish is not profitable, but nurturing a good view and also good, you know, fishing species resources is going to be much more, you know, profitable. For example, the marina tourism is much more profitable. And if you can nurture very rare species of the fishes and also profitable seeds of the uh, fishes and other uh, shellfishes, it's going to be more profitable. And also you use your gene technology and then the uh, you know, ecological nurturing technology and also for the corals and all those can brought, brought in more of the profit and the technology advantages to Fujian and meanwhile infrastructures is also very important marine infrastructures is probably the crown jewel of infrastructure building for example gas line uh, under the ocean uh, the internet cable under the ocean, environmental ocean protection in, uh, infrastructures, like the coral bases, as well as the shipyard building. And all these infrastructures will enable Fujian to become, to seize a commanding height in the marina economy. So I think through all these integrated, comprehensive view and the practices, Fujian actually solidified its foundation as one of the leading province in the marina economy, as well as the part of the whole world. President Xi urged the province to set an example in promoting coordinated regional development and integrated urban-rural development. What do you make of Fujian's efforts and achievements in this regard? Fujian's integration between the rural and urban areas started actually from the rural areas. So ever since the open, uh, ever since the first day of the reform and opening up, Fujian has balanced the rural and urban development because many of the uh, famous or world-renowned companies actually started their first job in the rural area, in the villages. For example, the CATL. For example, the Fuyao Glass. So ever since the first day, Fujian. Uh, has modernized their villages and townships. They have made sure, for example, infrastructure-wise, more than 99% of the villages can get access to the electricity, running waters, and uh, you know, solid highway. And also their public services we also equalized. For example, in Fujian, uh, all the township and village high school and uh, primary schools, uh, their education level will be benchmarked to the cities. And meanwhile, their financial services and their government services is basically the same level as well as in, in the cities. So if you are a foreigner, you want to you know, get something down through the government service station, you go to Xiamen, you go to Zhangzhou, you go to the big cities. The service level is there. It's very internationalized. But if you go to a very small town in Putian and also in uh, you know Zhangzhou, uh, under the Zhangzhou, you will find the same. Some village officers can also speak English, Japanese, or even French to serve your need, as well as for the uh, environmental protections. Uh, the rural areas, you go there, you didn't see much of the pollutions. Their standards for green and smart is the same. So I think by all these means, they have forged a very holistic and multi-dimensional development around the rural and urban coordination and also created more of the growth point in the local economy. That is Qi Qian, fellow of the Belt and Road Research Center at Minzu University of China. This is World Today. Stay with us.
You're listening to World Today. I'm Zhao Ying. Chinese Premier Li Qiang has called for deepening and expanding cooperation within the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. At the SCO summit in Islamabad, the premier urged member states to strengthen strategic alignment, actively respond to major risks, and expand personnel exchanges. Daniel Khan has more. Key points from Premier Li's speech included the need to strengthen political foundations through the Shanghai spirit, enhance security mechanisms to combat new threats, deepen economic ties among member states, and foster cultural exchanges to strengthen emotional bonds. He also called for greater coordination in multilateral forums, emphasizing the SCO's role in shaping a more just global order. Uh, Premier Li uh, proposed enhancing uh, strategic cooperation, expanding uh, practical projects in areas like uh, digital economy and green development, uh, addressing regional security risks and uh, boosting people-to-people exchanges to promote uh, uh, unity and prosperity within the SEO. That is Daniel Khan reporting from Islamabad. A joint communique at the conclusion of the two-day meeting emphasized the need for a multilateral trading system. SCO member states expressed opposition to protectionist measures, unilateral sanctions, and trade restrictions. The member countries reaffirmed commitment to peacefully resolving disputes through dialogue and emphasized the importance of mutual cooperation to build a prosperous, peaceful, safe, and ecologically sustainable planet. For more, we are joined by Hanan Hussein, an Islamabad-based foreign affairs commentator. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Premier Li urged SCO member states to strengthen strategy alignment based on mission and tasks. Given the differing development priorities across countries, how can member states overcome these differences and formulate a common roadmap that benefits all? I think we have key uh, starting points for that. Um, you look at the SCO's economic development strategy for 2030 was a result of uh, you know in-depth consultations between these very countries about what investment priorities should look like, what kind of trade links we're looking forward to. So we have a good understanding of, for example, uh, the costs and opportunities which both uh, which all countries see, and then coming together on the same table to advance those priorities. So I think a similar practice going forward uh, would play a big role. In understanding、um, how these countries can come together、uh, and move forward with a common roadmap, and I think we do have some, you know,、um, external、uh, factors that kind of inform、uh, convergence between these countries.、Uh, you look at the fact that、uh, there's a broad consensus on the use of mutual currencies, as、uh, the U.S. dollar is something that's seen as、um, as a bit adverse to、um, uh, to to maintaining their、uh, strong economic links and going forward with. With, with trade ties as well. So, when you see those kind of、uh, you know、uh, factors at play, I think there's a, there's a big chance that countries will be in a better position、uh, to make compromises on their current positions and then、um, you know move forward from there. Well, Li Qian highlighted the importance of deepening cooperation in areas like poverty reduction, the digital economy, and green development. What new opportunities do you foresee emerging from a collaboration in these fields? So、I think in terms of poverty reduction,、uh, there's a broad sphere. First of all, uh, uh, key sustainable development targets which each country is pursuing、uh, in support of poverty reduction.、Uh, how could, for example,、uh, transfers of technologies,、uh, greater agricultural trade,、uh, and you know, kind of bringing key sectors into play? How could that basically have、uh, have、uh, have a positive impact? And you know, with countries such as China, who have made remarkable gains in the poverty reduction space. I think、uh, there's a lot of room to kind of share best practices and lessons on that front. So I keep a close eye on that space.、Um, in terms of the digital economy,、um, I see、uh, a lot of space, for example, to, to integrate、uh, the, the e-commerce economy、uh, to ensure that, for example, countries such as India, Pakistan, China, which have a broad base for e-commerce, can come together to form this, you know, this,、uh, this ecosystem of, of interactions. That is organic to the SEO, so that's going to be one space that I look forward to. In terms of green development, I think、uh, you know the the energy transition,、uh, the way these countries are able to finance,、uh, you know, the, their movement towards clean energies,、uh, disaster preparedness is another front,、um, and kind of、uh, you know helping develop the capacities to 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 manage these uh, uh, these, these green development projects. I think that's going to be one one space. Where、um, all countries can come together, and I think、uh, we have key proof points.、Uh, the Belt and Road, for example, has played a key role 
in advancing green development projects. We've seen that in Africa as well. Uh, so there's this uh, there's a great understanding about how these countries can come together uh, to look at each country's uh, development priorities, their, de- distinct, their distinct development stages, and understand uh, where capacity building should focus. Yes, and uh, also uh, we see that uh, during the meeting, the idea of establishing a SCO development bank was discussed. What impact could such an institution have on promoting regional trade, investment, and connectivity? So I think in terms of financing key infrastructure projects, I think um, if the SCO decides to move in that direction, it would obviously need an organic, sustainable um, mechanism to, to ensure that financing. And I think uh, on that front, the SCO Development Bank would play a key role in uh, understanding how uh, these financial flows and these uh, these investments and financing can be evened out a bit more closely. So I think a dedicated bank to infrastructure financing is something that would uh, plug a key capacity gap within the SCO. And I think um, when you look at it uh, on, a, on a broader framework, I think... Uh, in terms of regional trade, look, there are a lot of other uh, regional trade frameworks, uh, strategies that are facing these financing gaps. You look to the International North-South Transportation Corridor, uh, Iran, Russia, India, uh, very ambitious, but uh, it's very difficult to see how, uh, you know, sustained investments and financial flows can make it, you know, mutually beneficial for each country. A lot of the focus has been on Russia, but not on, on, not on, on a lot of other countries as well. So I think from SCO's point of view, uh, this will be a novel development, and it will, uh, you know, focus uh, investments and financial support where it belongs, and that is between SCO's own ranks, without yeah. exactly being uh, increasingly dependent on external financial institutions. Okay, and uh, the summit issued a joint communique which, in which member states stressed the importance of countering protectionist trade policies and unilateral sanctions. What do you make of the message there? Yeah, I think the message is pretty clear. It's that uh, key Western countries, uh, be it the United States, be it Canada, uh, and parts of the EU, uh, have been uh, conducting key measures which have not been received very favorably for uh, developing states as well as SCO. Uh, you point to the fact that the U.S. and Canada increase a lot of tariffs on Chinese products, EVs, aluminum, steel. Uh, much of that resonates uh, with a broader problem, which is how countries, for example, like India, has also complained about the WTO EU's carbon tax on steel and fertilizer. So when these when these measures are p- passed on, I think there's very little understanding of how uh, what kind of consequences they have for SEO states. And I think with this kind of a statement, we have a united front on uh, these measures, uh, you know, not being allowed to adversely impact these industries and these countries. Yeah, so very briefly, what role do you see the SEO playing in shaping global governance, especially amid the rising geopolitical tensions? I think there's going to be a greater space to, to ensure that um, the 10 member states as well as the 16 partners are going to be engaged in a wide range of areas without exactly being an exclusive club, which only allows participation on certain issues and looks at, for example, everything from territorial disputes to SDG representation uh, as the interest of a few. So I think uh, the democratization of, uh, of uh, global discourse on uh, governance is something in which SDO is going to come up uh, really well. And I think the peaceful resolution of disputes is, is, a, is a telling reminder uh, that even when you have countries such as India and Pakistan, uh, which do not always see eye to eye, there's a focus within SDO that you know you could manage all these issues mm-hmm. when you come to the table together. So. Okay, thank you, Hanal Nusen, an Islamabad-based foreign affairs commentator. You're listening to World Today. We'll be back. You're listening to World Today. I'm Zhao Yang. China's housing authorities have pledged incremental measures to stabilize the country's property sector. The Minister of Housing and Urban Rural Development said the country's white list for financing will include eligible real estate projects and cover their financing needs with loans. Loans for such projects will increase to 4 trillion yuan, over 560 billion U.S. dollars this year. Authorities also said there will be more support for urban villages and dilapidated housing renovation projects. For more, we are joined by Einar Tengen, Senior Fellow at Taihe Institute. Einar, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, as always. 
So, can you elaborate more on China's whitelist program? And now that more real estate projects are included in this whitelist, how to ensure that the loans are used efficiently? Well, it was originally launched in January,、um, and it allows、uh, governments to identify projects、uh, that can be completed.、Um, and now, the, the big news is that they basically have doubled the amount of money that's going to be going into it. In terms of making sure. That the money is used properly. They're separating projects from developers, so they're not giving money to the developers. The banks are holding on to the money.、Uh, they have to approve、uh, the the loans themselves. So they get a list from the government, but then they have to approve them, and they're dispersing monies only for the purposes of finishing those houses. So that's how they're planning to keep things in line. So, what kind of impact will this expansion of this whitelist program have on those property developers? Well, it's it's not going to bail them out.、Uh, this is really not aimed at the property developers. It's it's aimed at、uh, the people who put down payments、uh, on pieces of property,、uh, projects that could be finished、uh, quite quickly, where there is a market for them.、Uh, remember, these are、uh, projects that are being identified by the government, but Have to have some sort of financial viability, otherwise the banks will take a loss and they will be punished. So they're they're doing being very very clever and trying to offset these things. But obviously,、uh, there will be people、uh, put back to work.、Uh, you know, you need window panes, you need doors, you need everything that goes into the house. And if people are buying them, they're going to buy、uh, white goods, you know, furniture and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. Well, so the, with loan approvals expected to double、uh, to four trillion yuan by the end of this year, are there risks of further inflating bubbles or encouraging reckless borrowing? And how will the government monitor and manage the debt risks? Well, the, the, they're managing the debt risk, as I said,、uh, through being very careful about the projects they select and making sure that they're economically viable.、Uh, in terms of how they're、um, looking at this. They're not looking to create a bubble, and they're being very, very careful about this.、Uh, they want to make sure that people have houses. They do not want prices to go down so that people walk away from their mortgages.、Um, they, but they don't want the prices to rise,、um, you know, very high because that creates another bubble. Remember,、uh, a lot of this is about the fact that median house prices are way above median income, especially in major、uh, cities. Uh, and the government does not want people investing in empty real estate、uh, when the economy, in order for it to work, needs、uh, money invested in、uh, companies, things that provide、uh, jobs, wages, and can drive this kind of dual circulation consumption side. Okay, and also、uh, there are reductions in mortgage rates and down payment requirements.、Uh, how, how do these measures align with、uh, the broader efforts to boost demand? And do you believe these policies are sufficient to restore buyer confidence in the property market? Oh,、uh, we'll have to wait and see. If I had a crystal, you know, if I, <laughs> I knew the answer to all these things, I'd be a very, very wealthy、uh, man.、Um, yeah, it, this. The government is、uh, being very cautious.、Uh, they do not want to inflate a bubble.、Uh, they want to make sure that there's、uh, some, you know, movement in the real estate industry. That there's confidence going ahead with good projects, but they do not want to repeat where you have these large developers using huge amounts of leverage,、um, and then, you know, releasing properties that were way above、uh, anyone's、uh, market expectations were then being bought by people and.、Uh, Speculative value, as opposed to、uh, any intrinsic value, they weren't even living in them. So you have these houses that were empty, that were just storing value, but、uh, no no advantage or benefit to anybody in the economy. Yeah, well, you know, the real estate sector contribute about six、uh, percent, um, actually less than six percent to China's GDP.、Uh, do you think the current measures、um, strike the right balance between stabilizing the property sector? And avoid over reliance on it. Well, I do, but I'm sure there are people who would disagree with me. I mean, obviously, the property developers would like to see money just thrown around like water.、Uh, the banks are very, very cautious.、Uh, the government is concerned about the people、uh, who put down money. So it's it's a compromise. You know, this is the way life is supposed to be. It's not that everyone 
uh, any one person gets happy it is about what is the right thing to do in the uh, circumstances. And I agree, you, you do not want a property bubble just like you don't want a stock bubble. Uh, the issue is you want to have people to have confidence in the economy. Uh, that is a slow process where you work hard, you save money, and then you invest it. Uh, and that's the way it should be, not this idea that I could bet mm -hmm. on things and make lots and lots of money or that money just comes because I do an IPO overseas or something. Money doesn't come that way in reality. It's, it's all about hard work. Okay. And how significant is the one million unit renovation initiative for dilapidated housing and urban villages? I, I thought this was really, really a good program because what you're doing is and these houses going to ha are going to have to be, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> fixed at some point. Uh, using it now uh, puts a lot of people to work. It puts factories to work, and it provides uh, homes uh, uh, to people in rural areas. Remember, uh, the urban areas have benefited a tremendous amount uh, over the last uh, 45 years, but rural areas have lagged behind. Uh, this is a really good program to kind of help equalize that at a time when they're trying to figure out projects that have real value, uh, lasting impact, uh, there, there is a return on investment. Having people who live in standard homes, uh, which are comfortable, uh, is good for everybody. Thank you, Honor Tengen, Senior Fellow at Taihe Institute. This is World Today. Stay with us. You're listening to World Today. I'm Zhao Yang. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has presented a victory plan that aims to strengthen his country's position to end the war with Russia. Key elements of the plan include a formal invitation to join NATO, the lifting of bans on striking Russia with Western-supplied long-range missiles, a refusal to trade Ukraine's territories, and the continuation of the incursion into the Russia region of Kursk. Russia has dismissed the plan, saying Kyiv needs to sober up. Zelensky presented the long-awaited plan as he addressed Ukraine's parliament on Wednesday. Prior to that, the plan was shown to U.S. President Joe Biden, as well as presidential candidates Kamala Harris and Donald Trump last month. Joining us now in the studio is my colleague Ding Heng. Thanks for being here. Hello, Zhao Ying. So what is your overall takeaway from this quote-unquote victory plan? Well, many of the points in this plan have already been floated by Kiev previously. Apart from presenting the plan to the U.S. side, Zelensky has also actually, in the lead-up to his Wednesday announcement publicly, discussed the plan's details with leaders of the U.K., France, Italy, Germany, and the head of NATO. However, none of those uh, previous meetings with European leaders have won their public support to this plan. This is one thing we need to keep in mind. It looks to me that this plan lacks a comprehensive strategy. In some ways, it is just a repackaged request for more weapon supplies and the lifting of restrictions regarding the use of long-range missiles against Russia. Um... I guess for many European countries, they want to avoid further escalation with Russia. And this is also true for the United States as well, for the White House, as the U.S. election is upcoming. So overall, I would say Zelensky's conditions for peace are very much at odds with the reality he is faced with. There is growing fatigue in his own country about this conflict with Russia, and there are continuous Russian attacks on Ukraine's territory. But on the other hand, um, maybe we can see this plan as part of Ukraine's last resort to strengthen its position, to strengthen its end uh, in any future uh, ceasefire negotiations with Russia. Yeah, so at the heart of the plan is Ukraine's desire for an invitation to join NATO. Uh, but so far, NATO countries in general have been cool on this idea as Ukraine is still at war with Russia. Why do you think Zelensky is still placing this point at the center of this plan? And will there uh, likely be warm up or shifts in NATO's attitude anytime soon? Well, of course, for, for Ukraine, it wants to seek this kind of uh, full-fledged protection under NATO's security uh, umbrella, uh, which is, of course, the key issue that paved the way to the breakout of this Russia-Ukraine conflict in the first place. But on NATO's part, I think 
its attitudes, its position will remain the same largely in the foreseeable future if we are to take a look at the new NATO chief Mark Rudy's response to the plan issued by Zelensky here. He declined to welcome this plan. He also didn't say when Ukraine might join NATO. So, uh, like you said, um, as long as this war continues, NATO is unlikely to send Ukraine any official invitation to join. Ukraine's future in NATO is something that we know that this uh, military alliance has has waited for 16 years since NATO leaders promised back in 2008 that Ukraine, along with Georgia, would become NATO members one day. Little seems to have progressed on specific issues so far. For now, NATO is in a very much in a kind of holding pattern. Countries like the United States and European heavyweight Germany, for example, um, these countries, to be honest, remain deeply concerned about being dragged into a wider war and military conflict with Russia. That's the reality. Uh, what do you make of some other points in the plan, such as pushing for uh, easing restrictions around the use of long-range missiles and calling for defense operations with Ukraine's neighbors in Europe to shoot down Russian missiles and drones? Are they wishful thinking or are they likely to materialize? Yeah, so um, depending on which point we want to refer to more specifically here, regarding the use of Western supplies or long-range missiles to strike deep into Russia, this is something that the United States and some other Western countries have um, actually time and time denied. Regarding joint operation with neighboring countries of Ukraine to shoot down uh, Russian missiles and drones. Uh, in July, actually, the then NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg poured cold water on this particular idea because, again, NATO does not want to be directly involved in this conflict. And I don't think the new NATO chief, Mark Rudy, as well as those neighboring countries would welcome this idea. And in this plan, there is also a proposal for deploying a comprehensive non-nuclear strategic deterrence package on the soil of Ukraine. However, on that issue, I think there is a lack of details on what a non-nuclear deterrence would look like in practice. Um, the military operation in the Russian territory of Kursk is a choice that Ukraine has largely made on its own. To me, this is a bargaining chip for the Ukrainian side as Ukraine uh, rejects any call for conceding its own territory and sovereignty. Of course, each country's territorial integrity should be respected. That's a key principle. But how this very important principle could be applied, could be adhered to between uh, Russia and Ukraine is a difficult question right now. I think ultimately this issue can only be dealt with on future negotiation table. Uh, well, in a Wednesday phone call with Zelensky, U.S. President Joe Biden announced a 425 million U.S. dollar arms package for Kyiv, which includes air defense and armored vehicles. How yeah. do you look at this package? Well, um, along with the announcement of this newly uh, this new package, there was actually no mention of any decision regarding whether or not uh, the United States allows Ukraine to fire long-range missiles deep into Russia. So this is a move that Biden continues to be reluctant and unwilling to green light on. The background information of this particular package here is that President Biden will soon make a farewell trip to uh, to Berlin, Germany, where Ukraine will be high on the agenda. And to me, this package or this move is probably one of the last few chances for Mr. Biden to show support to Ukraine. If Kamala Harris, the vice president of the U.S., is, is elected in November then she is expected to continue Biden's policy and largely maintain the status quo. But if we're talking about the comeback of Donald Trump uh, to the White House, uh, Washington is very likely to roll back the existing support for Ukraine. Well, as we look at the content of Zelensky's victory plan, as well as reactions from different parties, 
what do you think they tell us about how long this、uh, conflict will continue? Well, we are seeing a continuation of this very, very huge and drastic gap. Let's put it this way between the perception of Ukraine and the perception of、uh, of Russia on this、uh, on this conflict regarding its reasons and causes and how it should be put to an end. While Western countries will, in general, continue to support Ukraine for sure, they will be lukewarm to any. Further escalation with Russia. That's another observation. I think ultimately,、um, this peace plan jointly issued by Brazil and China, for example, which includes allowing, say, humanitarian aids to enter those war-affected regions, protecting civilians with a more forceful manner. Uh, halting the conflict, etc. Ultimately, the, this kind of joint plan should be taken more seriously by those parties, by those parties that are directly involved, because that's a more rational, balanced plan. Okay, thank you, Ding Heng. You're listening to World Today. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're listening to World Today. I'm Zhao Yang. For the past nine years, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, or AIIB, has emerged as an essential player in global infrastructure development. With over a hundred member countries and economies, it embodies a shared commitment to fostering a sustainable future through collaborative investment in vital projects. As the world tackles climate change, the AIIB is proudly at the forefront of promoting green financing initiatives. Sir Danny Alexander serves as vice president for policy and strategy at AIIB. He has been with the bank since its inception and continues to contribute significantly to its mission. For more on how the bank is setting the stage for a resilient future, my colleague Tian Wei has a conversation with Sir Danny Alexander. Danny, we are sitting in this room, which is the AIIB boardroom, right? Because. At the very beginning of your work here, you work as a secretary to the board, and now, of course, you switch to strategy.、Um, but just think about it: from zero to one, and、mm. now、uh, leading up to a hundred, what this process has been for you, especially when、uh, AIIB is working on financing for the future infrastructure. You know, I, I look at my staff badge. I have the staff number eighteen. <laughs> so when I first arrived, we had more, we had more board members than staff. We had more floors in our building than we had staff. And today, you know, we have hundreds of people、mm. based in our in our headquarters.、Mm. And you know, the bank only works because of the really strong support of all of its member countries. You know, the UK, China, another hundred and eight members beyond those two.、Mm. Um, and that comes through the the, the the board discussions that we have and the. Um, and the direction that President Jin and the management、mm. uh, really, really sets for the bank.、Mm. And you're right that、um, you know we've thought a lot about what should be the the vision for the impact that AIB wants to make in the world. We're a new bank,、mm. so we we want to help our members develop infrastructure for the next few decades. So that can be quite different to what they needed in the past few decades. So we call it infrastructure for tomorrow because it's about the future, it's about the green future, it's about te- digital technology, it's about the private sector coming in much more to play,、mm-hmm. it's about building connections between the the, the the members. I think it's a very good concept. I really wonder, as someone who started from the very beginning with this bank, how do you understand, digest? Adjust and also work with the very different winds、yeah. throughout the years. I mean, the, the world has changed a lot. You know, so much. Politics has changed. Geopolitics has changed. There's much more、um, disagreements, conflict,、um, you know, differences of opinion. So what we've worked hard to do with our members is to keep their political differences as much as possible outside the bank. By concentrating on what we promise to do, which is really good governance, every member is involved in the decisions. No、mm. member dominates.、Mm. Um, very high quality in terms of the standards, the policies, the strategies, the projects,、mm. and really focused on good quality 
development for, for, for our members. Mm. And you know, all of the members buy into that vision. On a daily basis, how do you deal with those uncertainties? Um, somebody's election, a change in administration, policies change within a certain government. So there will be tremendous amount of bits and pieces you have to deal with every day, I would assume. How does that work? I mean, I think the first thing to say is you have to stay true to your mission. You have to stay true to, you know, the commitments that you've made. So in the AIB's case, those commitments are really clear. Mm. And you communicate well. Then I think you can get past most of these issues. What is the best way to communicate well? I think you have to be very transparent. You have to be open. You have to be honest about the, about the, about the challenges you're facing. You have to build trust, right? So the trust between the AIB and its members and mm. the AIB and its board. That's a, that's a fundamental building block. You know, just sitting here, I could almost feel the ambience when all your members are sitting around and discuss issues. I'm sure there will be uh, one or two issues that some do not understand why right. we need to do this, yeah. and others would say, can we postpone this, uh, not as priority? So at those moments, how would, uh, you know, corporate secretary, which you worked as, uh, eventually play its role and how do you work with the president of AIIB and some of those members who have very different opinions? Well, I can give you an example. Please do. Um, so this is something I worked at, at in my current role mm -hmm. and, and led the work on reviewing AIB's energy strategy. And you know energy issues are really important ones to do with climate change but they're also ones where there are quite wide differences. Yeah. You know some say no coal, some say no gas, some say no oil. Some say only renewables. Um, they all share the direction that we have to be working towards this net zero transition. Mm. And so in that case, when we started that work, there were very wide differences of opinion. Should AIB rule out coal? Mm. We've never financed any coal projects. Um, how should we handle gas? And the, mm. the fact that for some developing countries, developing new gas fire is going to be a challenge. And so. That, that process took more than a year of, 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 of talking, of engagement, of discussion, of, on the one hand, being very clear mm. what we thought was important for AIB, that we're a green bank, that mm. we're, our focus is the climate transition, that we shouldn't finance coal. Coal is now something that we, as international institutions, we have to get out of. Mm -hmm. AIB's never been in it, but we have to be, we have to be out of it. But that as a development institution, we have to recognise that for low-income countries particularly, you know, developing some gas power under certain conditions yeah. will be uh, will continue to be important, and so you you have to have a clear vision and direction. But you mm. also have to take the time to engage with everybody to, to talk about it, but also to create circumstances where they can talk to each other, mm -hmm. where they can hear from each other. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, we came to a consensus around AIB's energy strategy, which is very progressive. It's very forward-looking. It's very clear but it's also very oriented towards the real development needs mm. of AIB's clients. Mm. But that's easy, easy an issue that could blow up. But, but it didn't because we handled it in the, in the, uh, in, in the right way. Mm. And we came to a good conclusion. Mm. Over the years, there is increasing discrepancies between, let's just say, green transformation aspirations different countries have vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what they consider as their abilities to implement. Uh, right. This is also reflecting in so many different areas of issues, in trade conflicts, uh, in uh, setting targets for national development, and the list goes on. So how do you see now the picture is becoming not just uh, about inspirations and aspirations, but about realities and, you know, real relations uh, between economies? You know, the, um, the, the, the amount of renewable energy being, uh, being installed in the world every year is going up and up and up. The last year, more than half of that was here in China. And, you know, when you take all the Asian countries together, you look at the way India is accelerating its, 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 its green transition. That's real stuff happening on the ground. That's not rhetoric, that's not... Um, now, the, 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 the pace of and the scale of what's going on is still lags behind what's needed, but it's catching up. And that's where multilateral development banks play a role, right? Just in June, I've completed a process taking through the board a new idea for AIB. We call it climate policy-based financing, which means we can support our members, not just financing the projects, which we already do, 
but we can also help to finance them to make the policy changes necessary to drive the implementation of their, of their climate plans. For example, in order to get the scale of investment in climate-friendly developments that we need, the private sector has to be mobilised. You know, the needs are trillions of dollars per year. Governments, development banks like ours, we don't have those resources. So we've got to use them really smartly to create the conditions where the private sector can, can, can come in. And so that means not just thinking, here's a project, but saying, here's a change that, that a given member can make, which is going to make it easier for the private sector to come in. And so that's for the first time AIB is getting into that to that area because we see that it's that if you combine the two things you can do much more good. That is Danny Alexander, Vice President for Policy and Strategy at AIIB, speaking with my colleague Tian Wei. And that's all the time we have for this edition of World Today. To listen to this episode again or to catch up on previous episodes, you can download our podcast by searching World Today. And for further discussion, please follow us on X at CGTN Radio. I'm Zhao Ying. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time.